start a presentation. Okay, are we uh, ready to roll? Okay. Great. Okay, thank you. I'll, uh, how come my, uh, oh, okay, that was a little slow. Okay, uh, finding a good fit for author manuscripts. I'm Terry Henner uh, from the Sabbath Medical Library, University of Nevada, Reno, and welcome everyone. Uh, exciting that we have a, a big group today. Um, I, I have a, I guess, a subtitle to this. It's a, really, we're going to look at tips on manuscript submissions and importantly, getting published in the right journal. And that getting published doesn't mean you or me, but the people that we work with that come uh, to us for help as librarians. And, uh, you know, think about what kind of help do authors need? And um, some authors don't need any help at all. We have uh, a department chair here who uh, submits manuscripts only to nature unless and gets published unless they are not as exciting. And then he'll publish in Journal of Physiology and that's it. He's, he's successful, he's been here forever. Uh, and his interest is in just high visibility, high impact journals and that's all he cares about. Other authors have different needs, and we'll we'll talk about that uh, shortly. But I, I need to. There we go. Uh, I couldn't read my screen. Uh, what we're going to talk about today are people who need help finding journals that are match for their content, uh, but also match for their intentions as authors. Uh, and people need help evaluating the quality of journals, and also understanding journal policies. So those are some of the things we'll look at. Finding a perfect match, uh, that's kind of what it's about, but it depends on the person and what they, they want to do. Uh, in my experience, uh, I receive a lot of questions from people who are initially just looking for a journal that's in the scope of their manuscript research. So here's uh, an email, they uh, their manuscript was rejected and they wanted to find a a different journal that would be more likely to publish their work. So uh, they, the starting point is always, okay, I need the, the title and the abstract of your work. And then based on that, you as a librarian can get to work trying to find a match for that content. How do we do that? Uh, well, there are a couple of things that you're actually matching the, the scope of the journal, whether it's a likely place to to publish that kind of manuscript, but also you're looking at the editorial processes and then the reputation of the journal and importantly, the author's intentions in, in publishing. Uh, it depends if they're a, a basic scientist with a, a big lab and a big grant, they want high visibility publications. Uh, they wanna make a big splash. If you are a clinical faculty who uh, has uh, minimal expectations for publication, but you, know, you just you want to publish something as your chair said it would be a good idea to publish something then you just you want to find a journal that will accept your manuscript and you're not as uh, interested in you know the impact factor or the quality of the reputation you, you just want to get published uh, without you know tarnishing your reputation by publishing in a real trashy journal so the scope of a journal uh, one way to find uh, journals that are in scope for your manuscript I don't know if there's a really good name for it. I think of them as suggestion tools. Um, I'm sure you've seen them. One, one you may not have seen is called the Journal Author Name Estimator, which goes by the, the name Jane, um, which is helpful for me because my wife's name is Jane, so I can always remember that. But if you just Google journal name Jane, you'll, you'll find this. And one of the nice things about it, you could dump in the, the title and the abstract and then say submit. And it will spit out a list of journals that are a, a likely home for it. And you can see that they will not only give you the, the title of the journal, but give you a little thumbnail sketch of it that is high quality open access and it's Medline Index. Uh, Medline Index, Medline Index, Public uh, Med Central. So 
This is a little very useful background information to give you a sense of what that journal is like. It also gives you what they call the article influence, which is the kind of an algorithm that they, they develop. And you can also show the articles that they use to help arrive at this decision about whether it's a good home for the uh, journal or not. So it will show you the, the relevant articles that <clears throat> fed into that evaluation of this journal as being a, a good match. So this is kind of a, a nice, fast and easy resource. And it's something that you can show your, your clientele and, and let them know, oh, well, we're suggesting these journals and this is something you should know that it's Medline Index, obviously a, a good sign, high quality open access, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's become commonplace now for every publisher, every major, major publisher to have their own journal finder or journal suggester. So Elsevier has one, <coughs> um, everyone else does. The shortcoming is you're just looking in Elsevier titles or you're just looking in Wiley titles, or you're just looking in Springer titles, but those also are, are useful tools uh, to find journals. Another tactic yeah, you can use, and I find it's, it's really helpful, is to search PubMed. Uh, you know that uh, what the keywords are in the, uh, the manuscript. Uh, in this case, we'll say it's quality of life and dialysis and chronic care. So do a title word search for, for those, you know, identify what the most important terms are, do a title word search. And then in PubMed, you find all these articles that are very close to the, uh, the manuscript that your person is considering submitting. And you'll see that it comes from sometimes unexpected places. So you Kidney International, Healthcare, uh, International Urology and Nephrology, BMC Geriatrics, so that, that is kind of a pretty effective and quick and easy way of also identifying journals based on the, the topic or the subject area of that manuscript that uh, you're focusing on. Uh, another area of help uh, you can provide, and, and let me kind of stop and say that there are levels of help that you can give to patrons and, and the area of scope and appropriate content is uh, the easiest one for you to address. And, and usually, oftentimes it stops there, but there are more detailed levels of help you can give. And it's up to you, depending on your time and the, the, the challenges of your job, how, how much more you're willing, time and energy you're willing to commit to that. What, but uh, going further into the process, a lot of it is just kind of advisory to let them know that oh, here are some things that you need to look at as an author. Uh, one of the things that you should always tell people is look at the manuscript guidelines in the, on the journal website. So here's like PLOS One, and they are pretty upfront. They say, here's what we publish. So we'll publish research articles or articles reporting new methods or clinical trials. Uh, I, American Journal of Medicine, they not only say what kinds of articles they publish, but what the uh, word limit is and what's required of you, uh, you know, whether it's an abstract, a cover letter, or a title page. So advising people that uh, they need to go to the website, look at the manuscript guidelines is a great starting point for anyone considering, is this the, a, a journal I want to consider? Uh, among manuscript guideline information, one of the most important, I think, is do they have an author withdrawal policy stated? Uh, because one of the um, problems that our faculty run into, they'll, before, <laughs> I guess that they, they're just kind of freewheeling and they think this looks like a good journal and they send a manuscript. And then a few months later, they will call me and say, hey, you know, this manuscript I submitted, I haven't heard from them in months and months. And I don't know what to do and whether I can withdraw my manuscript. Um, so it's a good, good idea to have a withdrawal policy up front. Otherwise, you can just kind of be on the hoof for uh, a lot of uh, fees and have your manuscript tied up in a, an unfavorable way. Uh, you want to also look at the editorial process, uh, things to consider, the acceptance rate, the processing time, the cost. 
One thing about acceptance rate, and there's not like a mathematical covariance, but generally the, the higher the acceptance rate, like if they accept 90% of the papers, oftentimes that would suggest that the, the quality uh, or the reputation of the journal is lower uh, or much lower. So that's something for the faculty to consider or for you to consider when you're submitting a, an article. Is the acceptance rate so high that you want to kind of give it a second thought? Same thing with processing time. If they say, oh, we accept every manuscript within two days. Well, it's not going through a lot of editorial review, is it? So that's something that you want to think about. And then lastly, you want to think about the cost. Uh, sometimes the better the acceptance rate, the higher the cost of the uh, article publishing fees because it is leaning into the area of predatory publishing. So, I mean, you can look at any, any reputable website and it will tell you what the acceptance rates are. Uh, Analysts of Internal Medicine, six to 8%. So it's pretty low, which makes sense because it is a very prestigious uh, uh, journal. <clears throat> Speed of acceptance, again, you, know, you wanna look at that and make sure that <clears throat> they outline that on the website. And then also things like citation metrics, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a bit. And then, uh, Finally, the cost, um, you know, this is $3,000, uh, $3,000 in US dollars. So that kind of freaks people out after they discover that they they sent a manuscript in and then without checking to see what it's actually going to cost to publish. So pe advise people ahead of time. These are things that you want to know about. Now, uh, the reputation of the journal kind of coincides with the author's intentions. If they are... Uh, I'll let this photo sink in, but uh, if they really are a, a, an important, accomplished author, they want to find high value journals. If they just want to publish because they think it, it will help advance their career or keep their chair satisfied, their uh, perception of the, uh, their needs is quite different. Uh, obviously in recent years uh, with the rise in predatory journals and confusion about open access publishing, a lot of authors are spooked about journals. Uh, they'll come to you and say, is this a good journal? Is this a reputable journal? How would you assess the quality of it? That's an important thing that you can contribute to in, in their uh, uh, authoring and publishing process. Uh, it's important to know that there is, I think, a, and I'm sure most of you have seen this, there's a spectrum of acceptability. It, it used to be that You'd see a predatory journal and it was so sketchy and so bad that uh, it was pretty obvious. You could tell people, no, definitely don't publish here. But a lot of journals are kind of on this continuum of, you know, it's not a great journal, but it's not a bad journal. Or, you know, it, it doesn't have malign intent. It's just, you know, the quality is not there, but it's, you know, it's a reasonable place to publish. Um, and I, I have this picture because, uh, you know, my wife often will find something in the refrigerator and say, does this smell okay? And, you know, that if it has a, a recent uh, sell-by date, you know, I'm, I'm okay trying to smell it. But if it's, if it's covered in mold, that's obviously a bad thing. So uh, there's this continuum of, okay, this is really good. This is okay. And this is questionable. And this is definitely a bad thing. Uh, that's the way it is in uh, journal publishing these days. It's hard to define something in a uh, just a totally bifurcated way where something is good and something is bad. Uh, a lot of things fall in the middle. I want to talk briefly about rubrics uh, because you'll see a lot of discussion about here are rubrics you can apply questions to ask uh, to determine if a journal is credible. Uh, they appear in journal articles and people will present them in, in uh, classes and things. Uh, and the problem with rubrics is that the people creating journals are reading the articles that discuss the rubrics. So things that they might not have included in the past, they will now put on their website, whether it's legitimate or not. So, uh, you know, you can make up an ISSN number. You could make up an editorial board. Uh, you can make up a journal impact factor number. Uh, 
those are things that you want to verify uh, and realize that just using these rubric questions isn't necessarily going to give you a, a kind of a valid determination. So in short, kind of verify, if, if you have questions about a journal, if you think it's sketchy, verify everything. Uh, if they say they're indexed someplace, just see if they're actually indexed uh, in that uh, platform. Uh, it, does the editorial board exist? Do the people on the board know they're on the board? I've, I've talked to faculty here. I've discovered they're listed as editorial board members of a journal and they say, well, no, I, I was contacted two years ago and then they never followed up and only to discover that their names are actually included in the editorial board. So there's a lot of really sketchy behavior. Um, impact factor, I mean, you can just make up a number, uh, as I said. Uh, another thing uh, in a reputable journal, uh, when an article has a DOI assigned to it, you should be able to search that DOI in Google and, and find it. So if you're searching a DOI and it, and it says not found, that's a red flag or something is wrong. So trying to determine if a publisher is legitimate or not, you know, you know some publishers are Elsevier. You're not going to question that or um, Wiley or Springer. Uh, some publishers are, you know, it's obvious they're bad. There's some publishers that it's become very fluid. Uh, I mean, one first step you could take, which is pretty easy, is just Google the publisher name and say, you know, with predatory. And oftentimes you'll come up with something useful like Kandawi. Once was predatory publisher, but it's evolving. And so it's moving along that continuum uh, more towards respectability. So that's an easy step you can take. And you'll also find that People, uh, authors, if they've had a bad experience with a journal, they'll say something in one of their, you know, scholarly association forums. So, you know, if you Google a, a journal name and say, is this predatory or is it legitimate, you'll find that people are sharing their experiences and that, that can also clue you in. Uh, you can also, you know, Beale's List used to be something considered kind of a, a Bible that doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, but some groups are putting together other predatory journal lists. This is just called predatoryjournals.org. And I'm not saying that this is like completely authoritative or this should be the, the end of your research, but you know, you could check here. And, and if a journal shows up in this list, maybe it's an indication that you should look a little further and you know, do due diligence in determining uh, whether it's a legitimate journal. Uh, you can also go to places like the Directory of Open Access Journals, which can give you some, you know, they apply some criteria and uh, some discrimination in determining whether uh, a journal, at least an open access journal, is legitimate or not. So that's a place you can go. Uh, one thing to uh, let your uh, clientele, your patrons know about is just some of the games that publishers play that uh, They'll make a journal that sounds very similar in nature to a, a, a respectable, reputable journal. They'll change the, the words around. I just like this because uh, you know, some, uh, uh, some distiller is creating a kind of an imposter version of Johnny Walker Red Label. It's called Jack Talker Red Level. Uh, and that's what you see in uh, journals too. They'll just change the words around and make you think that you're applying to one journal when in. In fact, you're applying to something entirely different. Okay, so applying evaluation criteria, indexing. In my mind, it's all about discoverability. If, a, if you publish in a journal that can't be found in an index, then I would just turn tail and, and run from that. So the first step, you know, go to that journal, search for articles published in, or find, articles published in the journal, see if you can find in Google Scholar. And if you can, I mean, that's good. If you can find in PubMed, even better. But that's, you know, putting aside all the other rubric criteria, uh, indexing, I think, is the foundation for uh, a, a good determination of, you know, whether a journal is quality or not. If it's, if it's indexed in respectable, you know, actual indexes. So, 
you know, you go to the journal of clinical medicine and it tells you very clearly it's indexed in Scopus and Web of Science and PubMed and Embase. So you look at this and you can turn to someone who's asking a question about the journal and, and you know, without a whole lot of other consternation say, yes, this is a, a good journal. I have no qualms about you submitting to this. Uh, another thing that people are kind of, they look to and become kind of overly enamored of is journal impact factor. I might've skipped a slide. No? Okay, journal impact factor. Uh, and, okay, that was just out of order. So impact factor, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, if someone doesn't quite understand what journal impact factor is, and that's often the case, I wouldn't overly complicate it. Just let them know it measures the relative importance of a journal and, you know, let them know that on average, if the journal has an impact factor X, an article in that journal will be cited X times. You know, try and keep, keep things simple. One useful thing you uh, have at your disposal, this was a study in journal citation reports, and they ranked the impact factors of all the journals that they were indexing at the time. And because the question always comes up, I'm sure you've heard this, what is a good impact factor? And you go, well, you know, one, one and a half, that's fine. So this will, uh, this will tell you, I would say, if you really are concerned about quality and impact and reputation, shoot for two. You know, if you have a, an impact factor of two or more, nearly 40%, um, you're, you're in the 40% ranking. So that's like being in the upper half, better than upper half of your class, right? You know, that's, that's good. Three uh, index impact factor, three, 20%. Now you get up to 10 and, you know, people always are impressed with these high numbers. Only 2% roughly of all journals have an impact factor of 10 or higher. So that is the stratosphere of impact factor, <clears throat> kind of unrealistic to expect that. So, you know, you can use these numbers, to let people know. One is not bad. Two is really good. If you're at three, you know, forget it. You, you know, that's as good as you need. Okay. So, um, you can, if you have a subscription to Web of Science, you can get to journal citation reports and, and look up journals, of course, Annals of Internal Medicine. One of the nice things about journal citation reports, it has this kind of normalized impact factor uh, um, data, which tells you within kind of the, um, The, the the cohort of journals that are similar uh, as far as the, the, the field, the discipline, the kind of articles they publish, it tells you how much more impactful or less impactful you are than the, the mean in that category. Now, if you don't have access to uh, you know, Web of Science or you don't want to invest a lot of time in this, I mean, you could just Google mo a journal title and say impact factor and more often than not, you'll pick up the impact factor. Now, it's possible they're just making it up, but you know, it's this is a, a quick and dirty way to get started. So Scottish Medical Journal, impact factor of 2.7. You can also use uh, uh, a ranking created by Simago, which is a European group, uh, and it it uses the, the Scopus database. So it's, you know, Elsevier generally, but they've created a Simago journal rank, the SJR, which again, creates a relative uh, impact of journals. The numbers are quite different. Obviously, you know, they have a starting at 106 and 37, 35. They also give you an H index for the journal. And I just find it interesting that the H index doesn't have much of a correspondence to the, their uh, journal impact rank. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, beyond impact factor, uh, this, uh, you know, you can go to a journal website and discover that not only do they have the impact, but they will give you very detailed information about the use of a particular article. So you can see how many people viewed it, how many people saved it, how many people cited it or shared it. 
So this is kind of a more contemporary and uh, in a way more valuable kind of indication because or there's more immediacy. You don't have to wait for the article to be read and other people to publish and cite it. Uh, this tells you, hey, if I publish in this journal, people are going to see it, um, which is a good thing. There are also organizations and scholarly societies that try and address this issue of uh, quality. Uh, COPE is one, is the Committee on Publication Ethics. Um, you can become, or publishers, can become a COPE member. This certainly indicates that they are interested in quality and legitimacy. So good first steps in kind of identifying a journal or identifying the, um, the value of a journal or the credibility. I mean, ask a colleague about the journal. Have they heard it? Do they read it? Uh, you can verify, as I said earlier, verify everything, the DOI, the indexing, the editorial board. Um, see, you know, call them and see if they answer the phone. Uh, you can verify the fees and transfer copyright info, search them in Google, check uh, DOAJ and various blacklists, look at the acceptance rates and timelines. And then lastly, does it pass the smell test? When you go to the publisher website, does it seem that they are doing things you know, properly? <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, this tells me I'm done. I hope I shed some light on the topic. I'm going to take a second to drink some water. And then I think we have two or three or four minutes for questions. So, yes. what questions do we have? Yeah, if people want, if they have questions, if you could put them in the chat. There have been a few comments. Um, Jana talked about how she uh, tell people the difference between a journal that is in Medline and a journal that is only in PubMed. Because the, like the PubMed Central stuff, ends up in PubMed, but is not necessarily always in Medline. I, right. That's a good one that <laughs> I've used. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, you know, in, in the interest of time, I had to kind of skip over some things, but the difference between Medline and PubMed is an, is an important one. Uh, Medline has to go through uh, a rigorous process of scrutiny to be included in Medline. And there are I don't know how many titles now, six or 7,000 titles maybe in Medline. PubMed, uh, you can find articles in PubMed through a, a wide variety of mechanisms. If you've published research that was funded by NIH, you're obligated to uh, submit your manuscript to uh, PubMed Central uh, as an archiving mechanism. Um, so there's less kind of scrutiny uh, in that regard. So yeah, that does make a difference. Uh, Jordan has a question. In your experience, has impact factor carried much weight in the LIS job market? Um, I know that's a concern for other medical fields. I I don't know. I'm not, I've not been in the LIS job market uh, in a while. But what, what I would say is that <clears throat> Different disciplines have different impact factors because of the, the number of people in the profession uh, who could possibly read the article and then publish and cite it. So in, a, in LIS, you, by virtue of it as a profession, you're going to have lower impact factor numbers. And so that could reflect poorly on you if, if you're not educating people who are evaluating your, uh, you know, your uh, profile, I, I forgot the word, uh, portfolio. You know, if, if you're presenting a portfolio of your research and say, oh, look, I published an article that has an impact factor of 0. 0.8, uh, that may not look good, but that may be the, the most professional and reputable journal in your discipline. Mm -hmm. um, something I actually posted when you were talking about are things in, um, in indexes, is that retraction, and I put this link in the in the chat for anyone who's interested, Retraction Watch recently published about Web of Science pausing, indexing Helion and Curious, which I know there are a lot of librarians who are not fans of Curious, but Curious is one of the cheapest open access, so a lot of people do use it. Yes, and medical students in particular. We have a, a lot of medical students who are just submitting 
And, you know, what do you tell them? I mean, they're a, they're a med student. They want to publish. They don't really care. And they, they don't need the highest profile journal. They just need something to put on their resume uh, when they apply for a residency that, look, I, you know, I care enough to publish an article. Yeah. So that was, that was the end of my statement. Yeah, but <laughs> um, what else? Are there any other questions? Looks like uh, as it's the top of the hour, some people are having to leave, but uh, get a lot of good feedback. People uh, enjoy. Oh, I almost forgot to put my part in to here. So we have a survey. Oh, yeah. There's... And our info on our next uh, presentation, which will be on writing protocols for evidence synthesis, um, November 13th. Uh, you will also, I believe, get a survey link in like an hour or so. Uh, all our snippets do get uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, so you can go to YouTube and search scholarly snippets as well. Um, but yeah. Oh, okay. Hour. And if I, if I could ask everyone who's still around, um, if there is like one thing you learned today that was new or interesting that you think you're going to apply in your kind of professional practice, uh, just include that in a, a chat message or the feedback or, you know, whatever we, uh, uh, we use as a mechanism. Uh, it would just be interesting to learn from my perspective. So I'd appreciate that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I hope this is useful. Um, thank you for, for all sitting in for the last 30 minutes and uh, have a good day. Thank you, everyone.